the nation will not be any more wiser than they already are. They will not be any more brilliantly uh, floored by any insights that, that might come. But they will take away a couple of good insights on what to do when you are up against the wall and you have too many barriers to cross. That makes it worth it already, Sunil, for, uh, for those of uh, us who woke up really early, quite a late night. Thank you so much, and over to your presentation. Thank you very much. How are you guys today? So <coughs> I saw a lot of uh, young MBA students. So let me start by sharing a story about how this theme is connected to a story that happened in my life about 15, 20 years ago. And like all B-School students, I was earnestly competing in many of these paper presentation contests. And I was chosen to be a finalist in, in the marketing stream of a paper presentation contest. This happened in the city of Hyderabad. Different themes, people came from advertising, people came from PR, people came from, and, and they all competed. And there was this very curious case of a paper that was shortlisted for the final. And the structure of the paper presentation contest was this. The, the, the presenter comes up and makes a present. That is a lot like what we operate in the business world, particularly in the B2B marketing space. Yesterday, after a couple of panel uh, questions, then, then there were audience responses saying, OK, what you're saying is so true for B2C, but in my business to business engagements, my customers don't let me speak so freely. What do I do? So I'll keep my. Uh, Unidirectional talk, very minimal. Uh, in public speaking, the golden rule is stand up, speak up. <laughs> I'll leave the third one to your imagination. Shut up. So if I can't earn your appreciation, I would have earned your, earned your gratitude at least. So I'll share with you the context that we are facing in, uh, in, the, in the world of technology. Let's say I represent the product side of TCS, and each time we sign a contract, we want to just go to town and put a press release out and put a customer story out. Nothing like that happens, simply because when the business guys are negotiating with the customer, one of the things that they clearly put in is, if you're Bank of America, if you're a Citibank, if you're a Bank of New York, or if you're, a, if you're Silicon Valley Bank in California, they will say, there is no way on earth that you will let our name go into the public domain because our stakeholders are very sensitive. So right in the contract phase, we are forbid from making any form of disclosure. So that's the customer gag that I'm speaking about. Another barrier for us is we are in a very crowded marketplace. Um, just to give you a case in point, the insurance solution that I sell competes with about 60 vendors. Just imagine if you're an insurance company like Nationwide or Allstate or AIG or, or some big insurance firm and you're trying to buy insurance software, there are 60 players who will just come to you and say, we can give a software that fits your solution. So we are very, you know, very crowded marketplace. And the final part is TCS Bank, the software that I represent, is a late entrant to the party. We've just started about eight years ago as a business unit. So these three factors put together really set us up for some severe competition. So what's the big idea? I just want to take one story of our really, uh, there are many feathers in the camp, but I, I just want to speak to you about one case study and how as a marketing professional delivered some value, all right? We use what is known as a customer collaboration continuum. I mean, it's like a mouthful if you pronounce it the first time, I'm, you might just, just choke on it. So let's say CC model. How do you put this model together? How did it, uh, it play out? How did we execute it? What are some examples? And then I'll just give you the whole rundown. So quickly, we picked a, a banking customer and we said, look, you're very happy with us. We want you to support with us in our journey. Initially, they said no way on earth because contractually we can't do it. So we went around and we said, okay, can we help you become famous? And who <laughs> wouldn't want to answer that in, in, a, in, a, in the affirmator? So we got a good positive answer and we started looking at it from the client's angle and said, what opportunities could we bring Credit Union of Australia and make them really famous instead of just thinking us as TCS or TCS Bank? When we started asking that question, how can we make our customers famous, we found a lot many ideas coming to. Many of them non-implementable, many of them we had to junk away, 
because they were impractical, but we found a few that we could really uh, harness. Most notable among them was an award opportunity. This was organized by a very reputed indus industry firm called Sealant. If you look up Sealant, you'll know that they are a big voice in the tech industry. And their awards are really reputed. It's not like you can pay your way through. It's, it's a fairly contested, very severely coveted uh, award opportunity. But they said, look, we don't have the bandwidth to do any PR and stuff, so you need to come alongside. And that's where we, again, uh, stepped up to the plate and said, we'll do the preliminary groundwork. And we tried a little bit of uh, trying to put the TCS story into the award application and so on. And, and so there's, it, it was a journey. We, we, it was a dance. We kind of went along. And that really was a good uh, um, in, uh, entry into their world. And really, as we started talking, we knew as marketers so much more that, than what the business guys ever told us. So the first insight that I want to leave with you is, if there is a possibility, you try to remove the intermediate layer and try and talk to the clients directly. The, the, the first uh, person voice tells a story that is so different than what you can ever hear from three layers of interpretation. Um, when we heard it in the first person, the, the, the story was just so very compelling. And then we also gave an idea to Silent and said, when you put this award opportunity and the awards event in New York, can you give us a panel opportunity where we can bring our client to the speaking? Which was, again, a bit of a tough call because some of these banks have very strict policies against travel, for particularly something like traveling from Sydney to, <laughs> to New York just to collect an award wouldn't make exact great banking sense to a banker. I mean, we are talking to bankers who know their, uh, you know, their ROI and justification and, and so on. So somehow we kind of persuaded them and said, look, from your own stakeholders, this will reinforce that they are banking with an institution that's globally up there. So, so we pitched it and spun around and said, your customers will feel good about the fact that they are banking with a world-class banking institution. So finally that happened. And when they came, when uh, the CIO came to New York City, again, you must realize that uh, why would a journalist in New York talk, talk about a, uh, a bank in Australia, right? It's so far away for them. And for, 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 for some of you who are tracking global affairs, for a regular American journalist, it's pretty much North America that's their focus. So to even think of Australia would be something that really requires a stimulus to, to get onto their consciousness. So we were able to actually sell this whole notion to a, a leading journalist and said, why don't you just have a chat and see what American banks can learn from Australian banking? Now, that journalist was a tech journalist, so they kind of saw the need for uh, this opportunity. And we, we kind of put it and said, just meet. Don't do a story. Uh, we just want you to meet, get to know each other, and stuff like that. So eventually, that happened. A great story came out saying, what American banks can learn from uh, Australia, which in turn led to another speaking opportunity in America's largest banking event called DAI Retail Delivery Show. So the customer was again um, invited to come back to the US and, and, and speak. So what you can take away from this is for every customer of yours on the business side, if you're a B2B kind of a customer, you need to have a model that will help you determine where you are in terms of collaboration. I'll give you specific examples in, in a short while. So the way we structured the model was we have what is known as a CPR. Uh, just like the CPR in the medical term represents something of a vital signs of how you're doing, we, see, we feel that this CPR helps us see how well we are doing in terms of our marketing our customers. So we basically use that model, and we've repeated that same success over and over again. So just in case you think it's just a flash in a pan, you, you had accidental success. No, we were able to replicate this model in APAC. We were able to replicate this uh, model in Europe. And so much so that our team, our entire marketing team within TCS Bank, is really measured on how much we do on this uh, collaboration uh, model. So um, I'll, I'll give you. What all, the, the, the potential to, do, to break out is unlimited. So if they are contractually forbidding you from putting out a press release, what else can you do? Oftentimes, we succeeded when we started turning the focus inward. 
we go to our customer and say, look, our annual day is coming. Can you tell us, give us a motivational video for our employees, particularly based on your experience of all our employees who worked in your bank? And oftentimes, they have some nice things to say. So that internal um, ice breaking gives us an opportunity to engage with the bank, which we would have never got a chance if we purely depended on our business guys to help us manage the communication process. So when I go with my video crew to take a video at, uh, uh, at, a, uh, at a banking institution, the business guys have no other option but to let me speak with their PR person, with their legal persons, with their compliance team. So we, as marketers, get to get, get to the other side of, of, of the uh, house and build connects with them. One thing, as you would imagine, leads to another. So if we did first a newsletter story and we got all the approvals, once people start bonding with you, the second piece of collateral becomes that much easier. So you start with the least harmful, and then you get to the high stakes event. So an internal news newsletter is a good example of how you can start a very harmless thing. You say, I am doing this internal customer focus for all employees, educating about all our customers, so can we feature you? So that's a, a pretty less harmful kind of a, a, an opportunity that they'll be happily uh, convinced as opposed to saying, hey, can you give us a quote for a press release? Because again, press release uh, invokes the fear of God in, in many of our customers. Simply because, again, think India, think Indian outsourcing companies, think uh, companies that are uh, putting press releases about staying this bank. And again, the bank's customers are thinking, oh, these Indians are coming and taking over our jobs. So there are a whole lot of emotional connotations associated with the word outsourcing. So we, we don't get into that area because our, our product business is so very different. With me so far? I can only go if you, right. So we used a variety of collateral tools and to, to build this uh, repertoire of content that we have. Uh, there are about 60 business units within the world of TCS. TCS for the outsider might look like a, a, a large corporation, but internally we have about 60 different teams spinning the wheels to, to get uh, stories out to their respective customers. So among the many things that we've done is particularly very heartening for our unit, TCS Bank's unit, which I represent, we've done some really path-breaking work. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, out of the 200 customers, 200 plus customers we have, we have done something of one part, one story of each customer in some shape or form. So about 140 uh, customers are profiled which is not really great if you ask me, because you, you have another 60 customers who are yet to open their um, mouth and uh, say something affirmative to us. But we are constantly pushing the envelope. We are constantly asking, begging, pleading, cajoling, coaxing, um, you know, uh, just to move the needle a bit. I'll explain a little more after I show you the, we do it in different marketing events and different regions. Every year we've been trying to raise the bar because whenever customers are not talking to us, what we do is we tell them of other customers who have done it in other regions and how it made a difference to their stakeholders in that market. So we reference manage it well. In fact, reference management program is a key part of business to business sales. If you are in B2B, you know that much of your marketing effort is to move the needle in the reference management program. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how some of these customers have become poster children to uh, be a good reference in helping get other business. Because if you know how big deals work, at the final stages of your negotiation, customers want to talk to other customers. Customers want to hear from other customers' voice and mouth what has been their experience. They actually get down into much detail. So I'll, I'll share about uh, how we... So this is a snapshot of what I call the CPR report. We call it customer progress report. And as you can see, under the internal case study, under the website, under the media coverage, under press release, whether it's a video story, we pretty much exhausted all possibilities. So it's like one big story you keep on spinning and re-spinning and harvesting. It's like a gift that keeps on giving. So this model is very important if you can just take away your blinkers from the press release or the white paper or the case study and, and you say, what are the other ways that I can find uh, telling the story. Because eventually, even no, no matter, like uh, Drayton Bird was speaking of yesterday, we think of B2B customers as large, faceless corporations. 
No, they are also human beings to whom a story needs to be told. And storytelling and great stories have great content. Great stories have great hooks. Great stories have great battles that were fought and overcome. Great stories have challenges that were overcome with the use of what you're trying to sell. So if, if you can get to that human angle and that battle angle and appeal to their emotions and tell a compelling story, then I think you would have made progress. So what we did was we were also able to identify pretty much all the awards in this God made beautiful earth for our customers and said, look, these are all the awards that are there out for you for the taking. Which ones can we nominate you? Which ones can we get you into the door? Nine times out of 10, we get the rejection. Our, our sales guys are so busy trying to sell. Our business guys are so busy trying to develop this opportunity. They are always saying, no, 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 no. But oftentimes, something catches their imagination and say, yes, this sounds interesting. Can you help us give us more information? And so we were able to really keep applying. What happens even if we apply and lose is the fact in the process of discovering the story of what we should tell, the marketing team at TCS and the customers have become close. And that leads to better engagement. That leads us, so the next time I need to talk to a PR person in a bank, I don't have to go through the channels internally because I'm having them either on my LinkedIn network or on my speed dial, I'm able to actually reach out to them. So it, it really is an amazing relationship building tool if you are able to identify opportunities in the form of awards to your customers. Because oftentimes marketings are looking for what? Opportunities for their company or their brands. But if you're also able to expand the focus, I'm not saying it's either or, I'm saying it ought to be both and. Both your brand needs to get the glory, but at the same time you should be looking at what can my customer become more famous for? If you can answer that question, how can I make my customer look good all the time, then, then, then you are thinking the right question. And of course the exposure continues because social media is one component that I've not uh, able to really spend much time, I'll just leave it uh, uh, gloss over it. We were able to leverage every opportunity that we got on our social media. And particularly, I'm big uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and then it, it, it comes off from your landing pages, it comes off from your central repository, which is your tcs.com or your corporate website, whatever. And events, awards, social media, all this come together from a central hub, a central repository of great stories. Where are your customers' stories? It, it need, need not be only the official public press release kind of a formal stories. Where are your stories? And so if you can just start thinking in these expansive terms, I feel this, this presentation would have uh, accomplished uh, its goal of raising uh, your consciousness on these items. So like I said, our arsenal tool can be pretty limited if you think PRs alone. Think with even small little things, um, internal newsletters, uh, internal um, uh, forums. With a company base like ours of 300,000 people, I, I don't want to plug in my company at every possible opportunity. We all are marketers, we know this, but I'll I'm trying to say how some of this really plays out in my own world. On the internal website, we have small communities. And so what happened is, let's say about 3,000 people work on a particular large financial institution. Those guys are now forming a community and they are talking among themselves on the intranet. So if I go to a particular financial institution and say, 3,000 of the people who work at your institution or who support your bank are doing this, is there some corporate literature of yours that I can distribute to them? Is there a video that you, your CEO gave that I can distribute to them? It's, it's just asking these two-way relationship building kind of questions that will really set you up for a lot of uh, customer uh, stories. And that we are targeting a ratio of one to 10. And uh, as you know, engineering companies are very metrics driven. So we are saying if one customer gives us one opportunity somewhere, can we really at least take it to 10, which, which include like right from the beginning of press release, white paper, case study, and, and so on. So at the end of 10, we would have said, okay, we've done a decent job of milking this particular story. Because if you want really a customer story to go viral or you want it to really reach a lot of stakeholders, or get to the same stakeholders in multiple channels, then, then your ability to spin this in multiple forms uh, really comes out. 
we are getting more disciplined in terms of calendaring. We exactly now know which month, what awards are coming, because submitting award forms, as you all as marketers know, is a very exhausting and a very cumbersome process. Some award submissions are relatively simple. Some award complication, uh, they're very complex and very complicated. And every bit of information about your client has to be vetted by legal teams and, and relationship guys and compliance. So it's a very long layered process. So we really have to make sure we have uh, built in all the time and, and we have enough alerts for people to say, okay, for this award that is coming up in June, are we ready to gather all our ducks now? And once we line up all our information, we are ready to go to the client. So those are the kind of uh, uh, takeaways I want to leave with you. And here's a concluding thought. Content leads the way. If you really are looking at saying, okay, I got this lead of a customer who's willing to talk, let me just go and do a, a press release. And then you accomplish that and you move on to the next thing, then you've not really mined the customer's story enough. In my opinion, if you can really sit down and talk to the customer and really get a good ringside view of what the journey was, then that gives you enough raw material to start weaving the story in many forms. So you have to precast your story, you have to really uh, get into the skin of the customer and, and live the story and really own the story, so to speak. Many of these times, oftentimes when a journalist calls, the goal is to be so good of providing much of the background information to the journalist at our, at our own level and then just take him to the client just for a sound bite. Because we want to protect the journalist's um, interest, but at the same time, we just don't want to be a gatekeeper or a traffic policeman and say, okay, the client is willing to talk, why don't you guys get on a phone on such and such a day? That's just a very minimalistic approach. But if we can do the whole story creation with the journalist first and then get the phone call just for the appropriate sound bites, then the great, uh, uh, the, the, the story you see in print finally really plays, plays out too much of the way you, you scripted it. And today's journalists are really short on, 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 on time because they don't, they don't want boilerplate information. They don't want stuff that, that they can easily get on the website. So if you're picking up stuff from the website and they can do it themselves, what's the value addition that we are giving as, as uh, communicators? So if you're really able to be in the creation process of the story, then both the customer is appreciative because you've taken a whole chunk of burden from them and a journalist is appreciative because you've given them a lot of value as opposed to just, just giving them, oh, go to this site or go to this link and, and so on. So those are some of uh, the key uh, uh, takeaways I wanted to share with you. I could tell you many more anecdotal, uh, uh, but uh, humility forbids me from uh, uh, sharing some of that. I'm happy to uh, take some questions uh, if you have. Much of the work that I do is US geography. There's some work I've done in Europe and uh, some work I've done in India as well. So if you have any questions, I'll pause for this point and uh, we will uh, have this conversation going on. Yes. Um, uh, really nice talk. Um, so my question is that uh, one of the key takeaways is that uh, the story plays a lot of uh, role in, in, in you know, pitching your um, idea to the client. Um, what what are the top three things that you have in your mind when you're creating a story for your client? Are they uh, focused on the background of the of the client, or are they focused more on your product? Great question. So when I was a much younger person, when I had a lot more wavy and flowing long hair, I did have them, by the way. Uh, my focus used to be how big is the client name. But as I matured, I realized that everybody loves this story if it is told well, no matter if it's big. Oftentimes it's the little guys that are taking on the big guys that makes it even more compelling than the big guys doing well. So initially my obsession used to be with how big the brand is. So I'll jump off uh, my seat and take the next slide is, let's say a big, huge, multi-billion dollar bank calls us. Uh, but at the same time, we are equally excited about like half a billion banks or a small insurance company doing some work somewhere. So eventually it's, first of all, a customer saying yes to the story itself, well, I'll, I'll start drooling over that opportunity. So the customer name, willingness to go out is my primary uh, criteria. The second part is, what's the battle? What's the story? What's the angle to the whole thing? If it was just, you know, the regular run of the mill kind of a story, then it, it won't excite us. You, you know, that oftentimes we are also as communicators, uh, are chasing 
excitement at a very subliminal, subconscious level. If the story is good, it just gives us that rush to, to do a great job, as opposed to the regular business as usual kind of a story. So, so the first one is brand name. Uh, is, is it big, uh, big, small? What's the type of the story? And then the second one is what is the, uh, the challenge involved? Oftentimes, it's a great transformation story. Like for, for one uh, customer, we had to replace about 60 different systems that a customer was using, that bank was using, with one single call set. Now, one is to 60 is a great peg that I can just entice any journalist. So what's the angle? That's the second part. And the third part is, how much can I go with the story? Is it just one? Some, some clients are very particular. They'll say, this approval is not a blanket approval. This approval is just for your newsletter. After which you shall cease and desist from any further, I mean, sounds like legal, right? Yeah. De cease and desist from any formal use of our name in any form of media. So how much is the leeway that I can go? So those are the three things. Thank you, Saman, <laughs> for that question. Yes. Nice talk. Uh, you just told us that voice of customer is uh, guiding light. It guides us which products to make and which products to sell it. So essentially, we follow the customer. If suppose we have an idea which is perhaps ahead of its time and it has a potential potential to be the voice of customer in future, then how to sell that idea? It's a great question. So far, I've not come up with any such brilliant ideas. Uh, much as I'd like to say yes, I had such brilliant moments, but. Uh, you're right. There are times when you want to, um, and often, sometimes, clients also play good cop, bad cop, right? Um, some of the guys who are doing direct business with you, they say, you know what, I would love to do this. I'd, I'd be happy to do this. They'll, they'll tell the business guys and us that they are willing to do it. But you know where the stopping comes from? The legal, the other teams that, that they don't uh, want. So they, no single person has the complete authority to let us do anything like a runaway train. So we've not had any such problem, fortunately, where our ideas were ahead of the time. What we are doing is pretty normal stuff, like I said uh, at the earlier stage. What we are only doing is we are trying to just expand our mindset a lot more and say, what else can we do? And, and, and we are succeeding because we are desperate. Um, our desperation is driving us to, to grow, really, uh, as opposed to some brilliant ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Someone right. Hi, Suni. Uh, just one question. Uh, starting with the anecdote that you started with about that person not having, you know, much to say about the research work that you carried out. I wa I was wondering what happens when there's really not much to say about it. You know, lot lot many times, you know, we know how the companies do things, how they do the research, how they do the, they reach to those conclusions. Where there's a specific need to hide those, the mechanisms that you have got to that result. And a lot many times people are doing that. So do you build a story around it just because you know you want In to? In fact, um, I didn't share with you the punchline of the story because I wanted to end my uh, speech there. There's actually a, a, a little further uh, part to that story. So the award distribution was done. I was given a, a prize. Uh, but the guy who said, you know, it's confidential, went back to one of the professors who was on the jury and said, sir, uh, where did I stand? What did, how did I do? Then the professor said, it's confidential. <laughs> uh, so to, to directly answer your question, yes, there are some companies who are not exactly doing rocket science kind of a stuff, right? There are some companies who are doing regular, uh, which may not be very, uh, if I might take the liberty of using the word sexy, you know, often it's not very newsy. Uh, how do you tell the story? I think the same approach of customer name, putting a face. Because I think storytelling has that compelling ability to take us to where we all started as cavemen, as tribals, as, as people who sat around campfires, listening to each other's stories. Because still, if you, if you really look at our DNA, our DNA is instinctively wired for storytelling. Once upon a time, the moment you say it, every child wakes up, right? I mean, there's something instinctual uh, uh, about storytelling. Uh, so even if in that situation where it is simple business, you can say this particular, again, if you got customer approvals to say, this customer 
challenge, solution, result. Simple story, short story, well told, I think will get you the, the, the results that you're looking for. But the key there is, clients don't give you approvals. So oftentimes my business guys come to me and say, look, you can't, you can't, while you're alive, you can't get the customer name. Can you say a large financial institution? I mean, who'll believe that, right? I mean, you cannot, you can say a large financial institution in Delhi, but there are many large financial institutions in Delhi. How would you? So there is no face to that story. There is no character to that story. So uh, my response to you would be, even in that mundane stuff that you're doing, if you can find stories that can just say, there was a challenge. Because eventually, business to business, uh, or, or even in the B2C space, we all have stories, right? I mean, with you, we, we've seen this. They are taking even small things like uh, a fevicol and they are building a story about how it binds the nation. Uh, so there are stories that can be told. Um, it, it's very uh, deeply rooted to our DNA. I, I, you, can, you can mine those stories if you ask. All right, thank you for your time. If we don't have any more questions, I'm glad to sit down and yes. Was there an NDA which was signed with the customer? Because a lot of times when you see, uh, from a B2B perspective, a lot of non-core activity is outsourced. And you can actually tell a story about that, which is fairly simple to actually say. But the main juice is when they actually give out an engineering piece of work, something that they don't want the world to know. But you're doing something great with that, right? And while you would want to say a story, and probably you get approached that you actually mentioned about, uh, what is the value that I'm actually giving to the client? to taking the story out. Most of the times the clients don't do because there is an NDA in place, a non-disclosure agreement. How do you go about that? Have you ever faced a situation like that before? That's a great question. In fact, uh, his question is, um, how do you give out really juicy details about a particular institution or a particular client without violating any uh, contractual or, or oftentimes they may not be even contra contractual, it might be even conventional understanding of of, of that uh, client relationship. Great question, thanks. So here's the thing we did with our customers. In the instance that I gave of Credit Union of Australia, what they were doing was they reduced 500 man years of um, uh, effort, human effort of coding simply by replacing our uh, solution for, for their online uh, corporate and uh, retail businesses. 500 man years of was a great phrase for us to talk to. Uh, we just, like, if it was an NDA in place, they would have chewed us out. Uh, how could you even give out such a confidential piece of information? But the point was, you can't have an NDA, it's like tying your arms and asking you to find a fence, right? Uh, it, it, so we go and say, look, if you want us to tell us a story, and a, gross, a great story can be told only with good metrics and good building blocks, these metrics are important. So we only, and again, uh, how persuasive are you? And you shouldn't. You should be thick-skinned like I am. <laughs> they keep saying no. They keep saying no. I don't take it personal. We keep asking. I'll give you a great example. Very recently, one big uh, client of ours, they said, "No way on God's earth we'll let you do your own press release." But what they they went ahead and did was, in their quarterly announcement to their stakeholders, they announced and said, "We are replacing our core banking system." and they, they mentioned the company's name, which is a huge delight for us because it's already in the public. So we waited for time to buy it. Exactly around nine months later, we went back with a very solid press release and, and we said, look, again, we tied up awards, PR, everything together and said, your, custom, your CIO is speaking at this banking event where we are also sponsoring. He is speaking on technology there's no greater time for us to rehash some of what you said in your public quarterly announcement and give us this press release. There was no way they could have said yes to that strategy. We were able to get through. Do, do a Google search of TCS and Zions Bank in the US, you'll find a very compelling uh, uh, press release. So oftentimes, NDAs are, they, they protect you, but how do you come out with this out of the box kind of a thing where 
We used their own words, built a story, went back and persuaded them to give us a green light. But thanks for asking that question because it reminded me of this. Thank you very much. It's been great here. Nothing like anecdotes to drive a point home. But before that, um, Sunil, can I just request you to crunch the story you were telling me over coffee, uh, which I think will really relate to a lot of people here. The uh, New York Marathon, was that the one? So and, and the kind of work you did, and at what point of time you could actually speak about it. If you can just give us a short brief on that. So as, as many of you might, uh, fitness buffs know that TCS is also the uh, official sponsor of TCS New York City Marathon. Uh, for those who are not into running and it's out outside your stream of consciousness, it's like the World Cup of running, so to speak. Uh, there might be two or three big events, but New York Marathon is epic. 55,000 runners uh, take off from Verrazano Bridge and it's huge. About two and three lakhs of spectators, uh, two, two or three million spectators come out and cheer all through the day. It's a very minus seven, minus eight, minus 10 kind of a weather depending on which blustery weather or whatever. It's huge for runners. For many years, TCS was doing the mobile app and stuff. We were never allowed to really go to town. But this year, 2014, was the first year where we were the title sponsor. And people from all walks of life now know what TCS does simply because we were on the subways, we were on uh, the, the cab radios, we were on the cab TVs, we were on holdings, we were, for the first time, an Indian company just just owning a premium event such as this was, was a huge uh, event. Now, because of that, even channels and newspaper outlets that n uh, never um, uh, paid attention to TCS as a company started asking, who is TCS, right? I mean, they, they just want to know why we are making such a huge investment. Uh, just disclaimer, I'm not an official corporate spokesperson here in Delhi, but this is a great story about how you can touch the lives of individuals who are not even in your buying community, but uh, they, it gives you a, an opportunity to go back in. So we, we're doing this because we get a lot of business out of US, and we want to give it back to the community as a fitness uh, initiative. In any case, it was me who asked you to tell the story, so, so you are therefore exonerated. But please, let's hear it for Sunil Roberts.